Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. Your wife left with only a note. That's the story today. Enjoy watching it. The note left to her contained the following. Joey, I'm leaving for a while. I can't say for how long. You're not to blame. I just met someone. Please don't try to find me or contact me. I need this. With love, Shelly. For me, it was an absolute shock. My wife, with whom we've lived for 21 years, disappeared so suddenly. My name is Joe Mason, and her name is Michelle Shelley Mason. We met in elementary school because our parents worked together. We started dating in college. We got married after graduation. Shelly is a lively, energetic blonde, and I am of average height and build, with chestnut hair and eyes. We both stay in good physical shape thanks to sports activities. We have two children, both in college. Upon receiving the note, I immediately called them first, James, and told him about its content. He was shocked. I promised to keep him informed. Susan wasn't as surprised by the note, although she admitted she didn't know about her mother's plans. She mentioned seeing her having lunch with a colleague from work, William Connor, but didn't suspect anything serious. After that, I started investigating Connor online. He's a cardiologist who recently moved from the hospital where Shelley worked. He's 40 years old and divorced. There's an incident in his past during surgery where a patient died. I tried to find his current whereabouts but couldn't. I asked a friend for help in the search. I checked our accounts. Shelly's checking account was not touched, but her automatic deposit was not made this month, and she took almost all the savings, more than $200,000, that were in the Vanguard account. I called Bill back and asked him to track it down, giving him the account number and other information. He called Vanguard about a withdrawal that was listed as in process. The representative said he would contact me. Our house was jointly owned and cost about $800,000. Maybe she was planning some kind of setup, or maybe she's just a thief and an adulteress. I drove to her parents' house, about 30 minutes away. It was Wednesday, but both cars were parked at the house. Mark and Sally Benton worked with my parents at GMG Enterprises for many years. They talked sometimes, although more often when I was little than lately. I had no difficulties with either of them, and I thought they raised their daughter well, until today, that is and I knew that Shelly was close to her mom. I went to the door and knocked. Mark opened it. When he saw me, he was not surprised. He simply stepped aside and led me into the kitchen where Sally was sitting at the table with a glass of water. Hello, Sally. What do you know that I don't know? Mark said we mostly. Sally knew that Shelly was on a dangerous path. We thought so. She talked to her mom about everything, and we agreed not to tell you about it until she had a chance to discuss it with you. Sally, she didn't give me a single chance, and she took all her savings. Maybe I'll try to get her arrested for this unless she returns half of it soon. As you can imagine, I am not happy with her and her buddy Joe. You shouldn't use such expressions, Joe. Sally wasn't really angry. She believes that he is her betrothed. Do you believe it too? because I consider him a thief, at least of money. I met him once she brought him here about a month ago, but then she didn't say why he was with her, she simply introduced him as a work colleague. We chatted, and in the end, I thought that for some reason, she wanted to introduce him to her parents. I warned her later, but she obviously didn't listen. I assume you know where she went. We shouldn't talk to you about this, Joe. She's afraid you'll react badly, Sally said. Mark, I'll still find her within a few days. And she is absolutely right, I will react badly. At that moment, my mobile phone rang. It was Bill. He reported that both Shelley and Connor took jobs at a hospital in Pittsburgh. They rented an apartment near the hospital. Shelley and Connor have a joint checking account with some money in it, $200,000 has not yet appeared. Bill thought they might have gone offshore. If so, he could still track them, but it would come at a cost. He'll let me know. During the conversation, Mark and Sally watched me. They watched me write down the addresses of the hospital, bank, and apartment in a notebook. Bill also gave me the cell phone numbers of the two. 
I didn't write them down, I just remembered them. I didn't want them to know that I had them. Sally, when she wants to come back to you, will you accept her? Why did you even think that she would do this? It sounds like she wants a clean break, no contact. I don't think she'll ever come back, except for money. I think she'll want to come back, Joey, but how soon, I don't know. If she comes in right now and apologizes, maybe we can go to counseling. The more time she is away, having sex with another man, living with him as a wife and husband, well, you get the idea. I don't want you to break up, Sally burst into tears. Mark patted her on the shoulder, and I said goodbye and drove back to my office. As I was about to enter, Bill called again. He said Vanguard delayed the transfer of $200,000 as a precaution against possible fraud. He said that now they would not give out the money. Although the account was joint, it appears that there were some irregularities in the transaction. I told him what they told me when I called there. I called them back and emphasized that the withdrawal was illegal. I was told that the transfer was blocked due to several anomalies in the method used. I asked someone in my office to urgently issue a TRO against Vanguard, as well as Connor and Shelley. He spent about an hour on this. I then sent it electronically, this should stop the theft for a while. A TRO is a temporary injunction that is usually accompanied by an application for a permanent injunction. I called my family in Oregon, where they were living in retirement, reported what happened. They were very surprised and full of sympathy. Then I sat down and thought about what else I could do, and moreover, what I want to do. I did some quick research and found out that adultery is not a crime in Pennsylvania, but in Virginia, it is a misdemeanor. I just noted it in my head. I decided to do what I often did with difficult problems, call my mentor, Uncle Jed. Jed is my mother's older brother and lives near us in D.C. He is a lawyer but retired several years ago. In fact, he is a lobbyist, but for me, he was a source of guidance, not so much in the field of law as in life itself. I asked if I could pay him a visit. We agreed on dinner, I'll pick up some fancy pizza and beer and bring it to his house. While I was waiting, I called a private investigator I knew. I asked him to find out how long Shelley had been intimate with Connor. This may have gone on for some time, who knows? I tried to think if I had noticed anything about Shelley lately that might make me wary. I had just completed a long and difficult trial that lasted four months. We had a favorable verdict and negotiated how much it should be reduced. Perhaps while I was on this case, I didn't pay much attention to Shelley. For six months or so, including preparation, we were still having sex. Well, until a month ago, then no. I should have noticed this before the break. There was no change in her response or in frequency either busy or not. I enjoyed sex with Shelley, and this was not the first lengthy trial in which I participated. After a few weeks, a rhythm appeared, and at home, I was no longer so distracted. On the way to Jed's house, I first stopped at the clinic and took a series of tests for sexually transmitted diseases. Then I stopped for pizza and beer. Jed met me at his door, the same one I remembered from childhood, the same house. His last wife disappeared about a year ago. For 40 years, he was married to a wonderful woman, Ellen, but she fell ill with pneumonia and died five years ago. Since then, he has had several women, but none of them lasted long. Today, there was no one there except himself. What could bring such a busy lawyer to such a remote place? I thought. I told him, showed him the note, and let him know what I had done. It's clear, it doesn't look like her. I want you to sit here for a while, just think about your life with her, what it was like. I'll get you something to drink. I'll be back in a while. I did what he asked. I thought about all the good things we had with her. We laughed, raised children, had sex, and communicated. We did everything together as a couple. I found myself silently crying as I took it in. She was the only person in my life for over 20 years. Of course, we had children, but for me, she is the only one I loved and trusted the most. My tears flowed as I remembered our lives. No, our lives together. Now she's gone, poof. How could she do this to me? I finished sobbing into my sleeve. Jed came back with two drinks and a bottle of whiskey and just let me cry. I poured it into glasses. 
I looked up at him as he knocked over his and did the same. A good thing, it distracted me. You're so damn smart. Thank you. Do you want her back? I want my old life back, but it seems impossible. I don't know if I want her back. She might do it again, if I even survive this time. I think you need time to get over everything. You may need help to do this. I just did the most obvious thing. I allowed you to release the pain, some of it. But you need more help than I can give. I don't have a very good track record after Ellen, anyway. Well, you still have sex. Yeah, but that's not enough when you already have everything. Then we had a two-hour conversation about what our marriages were like. We went back and forth. There were tears in his eyes, too. But Ellen will never return, Shelly, hard to say. I was beginning to realize that I might not be able to be with her anymore. When we finished the marathon session, I was overcome with a feeling of righteous anger so strong that I thought I was going to fall. I stood up and staggered out into the street. I started punching and kicking an old heavy bag that he had hung on a tree in the backyard. I was in a furious rage, more intense than ever before. Everything was directed at Shelly. I hit her in the face, kicked her in the body, absolute and sensitive evil. Jed watched from the porch. He later told me that he almost dialed 911. Finally, just before he was about to call, the pair fell from the tree, and one of my kicks sent it flying through the fence to the neighbors. I fell to the ground, sobbing. Jed helped me into the house and calmed me down as best he could. Either way, I was exhausted, wet noodles. I was in good shape, but I had far exceeded my capabilities. After some time, I don't know how much. He laid me on the sofa and covered me with an oriental robe. I slept all night. This morning, I woke up to the smell of bacon and coffee. I rolled off the couch and stood up unsteadily, but I pulled myself together. I was damn hungry. We ate bacon, eggs, and toast. After that, I headed to the shower. I shed the clothes I was wearing and put on the tracksuit Jed had lent me. I shaved, shampooed, and generally restored myself. My hands were red and swollen. I put antiseptic on them and bandaged them. Shelly was a nurse and taught me how to do this. My whole body hurts. There was a cut above his right eye. I used the butterfly patch, and it looked like I had been in a brutal fight and lost. About 24 hours had passed since I read the note. Jed wrote down the name of the marriage counselor he used, Mary Stevens. He said that he believed that she would help me get myself in order. He said that marriage counseling does not have to involve both parties. I took the card, drove home, got dressed for work, and entered the office building. The staff noticed my shabby appearance, their eyebrows rose. I called a meeting of the entire team, we have 12 employees, including 4 lawyers besides me. I explained what had happened and said that I was unlikely to come to work much until the matter was resolved. We agreed on a replacement lawyer for the duration of some of my appearances. I sat in my office and, miracle of miracles, did some work. I had lunch at the office and worked hard all day. At 17.30, I left and went home. Shelly took clothes and other belongings, but most of her personal belongings were still there. I went to Lowe's and bought boxes and tape and then systematically packed all of her things into those boxes. Clothes, books, photo albums, shoes, everything. I put it all in the garage. Shell's car wasn't there, so there was plenty of room. I called Bill and told him that Shelly had taken her car. Then he went around and collected all the photographs of Shelly from all places in the house. I threw them all into the trash bag, frames and more. I sat and thought about the state of affairs. I cooked food in the microwave and went to bed, but when I was about to fall asleep, it occurred to me to check our home computer and her mobile phone, which was in the charger. There is her email on the computer, which got me nowhere. The phone had calls from a number in Virginia dating back approximately six weeks to today. There were also several text messages addressed to Connor, aka Bill, later Billy. These messages set up lunch dates and pre-work meetings, nothing too incriminating. I went to bed. On the free day, I went to work again. It worked for me the day before, it worked now too. After lunch, a private investigator called. He said that he was located in a lunch place where women from Shelley's department often lunch. 
He just listened. It's not surprising that the disappearance of the boss and the handsome doctor has become a huge topic of discussion. Both were the subject of intense speculation even before their disappearance. One woman saw them leaving the motel during the day, another kissing near a nearby restaurant. In general, the staff was convinced that they were lovers. A private investigator found rental documents for motel rooms in the weeks leading up to Shelley's departure. She rented a room for half a day three times, paid in cash. There are copies of receipts, there were car numbers, twice hers, one not hers. I decided it was worth taking a look at Connor's finances. Why didn't he pay his share? So I called Bill again. It took him about two hours to determine that about ten months before they moved, Connor was facing serious financial difficulties. He has a mortgage, car, and credit card debt. After the divorce, the hospital collected AAR from his salary. He didn't pay child support. It occurred to me that on his part, it might all be about money, dollar two hundred zero 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 to be exact. It made me feel sorry for Shelley for about 10 seconds. I then punched a nearby office chair, knocking it over and sending it flying across the office. My assistant poked her head through the door to see what the noise was. I had to apologize to her. I called and made an appointment with a marriage counselor. Then, I walked down the hall to the family law firm's office and asked to see Mildred Hoover. Mildred was the best divorce lawyer in the area. It turned out that she could see me and immediately took me to her office. I explained the whole situation to her. I found out that the trial was scheduled for next Monday and that Shelley received the summons at her job in Pittsburgh. I didn't need Mildred for this, my company could do this too. I asked her about what might happen in a divorce. She took some financial data and spent some time on the computer. She doesn't seem to be doing all that well because of the prenuptial agreement. Your law practice is excluded from reimbursement. She will receive half the value of the house and half the assets accumulated during the marriage, which I assume is about most of the assets. At the same time, she will have enough to feel comfortable. Let me think about it, we'll see what happens at the TRO hearing. But get your papers ready about adultery and everything else. That evening, I ate microwave pizza and went for a long run. At about 9.30, I called Susan. She picked up the phone just as she was about to send a message to voicemail. Hi dad, how are you? Fine. Just wanted to know if I've heard from your mom. Well, there is, but I promised. Damn it, she says you're trying to get her and Connor into trouble. She should be in court or have a lawyer there on Monday, she's upset. What's going on, dad? Money, someone tried to take it out of our joint investment account. I filed a lawsuit to stop this so we can work it out. It seems to me that perhaps your mother did not know about this, not sure. Is she safe with this guy? She looked worried. I have no idea if she's safe, it's up to her, really. She can leave if she feels threatened. Why did you ask? There in the background, some screams were heard, a male voice. I didn't hear what he said, but I think he was angry. Mom said it was nothing to worry about, I hope so. There's nothing to be done from here. We talked about her studies and the new friend she had made, then they hung up. I had a hectic weekend. The important day was Monday, TRO in the morning and meeting with a consultant in the afternoon. I talked to James, who hadn't heard anything from his mother at all, and went to the gym. There I saw Shell's good friend Clara Barton, another nurse. Clara saw me and tried to escape through the back door. I managed to stop her before she could do it. I don't want to talk, Joe. It still won't do any good. You knew she had sex on the side, Clara. Why didn't you let me know? She said you would react badly, maybe you'll become cruel. I'm more like her friend, and I don't know you well enough to know if she's lying. Well, what about this guy Connor? Isn't he a source of trouble? Because that's exactly the impression I got. Yes, he is a source of trouble. I told her about this, but she was sorry she was getting sex that she liked. She thought she was in love, and he was her betrothed. Yes, I heard this from her mom. I wish she would just talk to me about it instead of sneaking away like she did. I think she'll be back very soon, he is not her betrothed. All this can subside if you are patient. No, it won't subside. 
She made her own bed, and now she can't crawl back into mine. Clara glanced at me and shrugged, then returned to the treadmill. She looked great in her snug workout attire. I couldn't help but admire her as I openly observed her. As she resumed her exercise, our gazes locked. I grinned, and she returned the smile. I lingered nearby, watching her from behind. Catching my eye in the mirror, she continued to smile. Increasing the treadmill speed, she showcased her toned physique, and I playfully blew her a kiss before departing. The encounter lingered in my mind, sparking a sense of anticipation. Clara's pleasant company lifted my mood, and the thought of her stir excitement within me. It's been a while since Shelly and I were intimate. I was dressed in loose gym shorts, occupying the far end of the hall. Taking a seat on the leg press machine, I set the weight heavy and began my repetitions, three sets of twelve. Gradually, I increased the weight, focusing on my workout. Clara caught my eye as she stepped off the treadmill and approached. She stood nearby, observing me as I lifted the heavy weights, completing three sets of twelve, a challenging feat. Exhausted, I finished my final set, lying back and breathing heavily, meeting her gaze. There was a palpable tension between us, I could sense her interest. Her eyes lingered on me, unabashedly drawn to my body. With a hint of guilt, she proposed an invitation, suggesting we continue our interaction at her place across the street. We quickly agreed, arranging to meet at the entrance. There was no need to gather belongings, she assured me I could return afterward. A smile played on her lips as she hinted at what awaited, and I eagerly accepted the invitation. Clara was about 30. She is of average height with a thick, curvy body. She has brown hair and hazel eyes and is beautiful in the usual sense of the word. She was married and now divorced. Without a doubt, she was my best recovery subject. I got up from the bench and followed her out the door. There were only two other people there, a guy and a woman. They both looked at us as we left and smiled. All four of us smiled. Clara led me across the road to a residential building and up the stairs to the second floor. The view as we climbed was fantastic, with her swaying and giggling provocatively. She opened the door and stepped back so I could go inside. I quickly looked around the apartment, but she grabbed me from behind and turned me around, pulling me towards her body and raising my face up. I kissed her in response. She kissed me as passionately as I had ever been kissed before. We broke the kiss, and she sighed. I always wanted you, but you were my boss's husband. But now I'll get you. In approximately 60 seconds, my vigor returned, and we embarked on round two, with Clara taking the lead this time, a role I embraced wholeheartedly. Our climax was once again synchronized, and we both surrendered to the blissful exhaustion. After a moment of rest, Clara stirred me awake, suggesting I fetch my belongings and join her for a shower at her place. The room was dimly lit as I hastily dressed and gathered my belongings into my bag. On my way out, the woman from earlier flashed a knowing smile. Enjoy yourself, she quipped. Absolutely, thanks for asking, I replied with a grin. Upon my return to Clara's, she had already showered, and I followed suit. Slipping into a fresh pair of sports shorts from my bag while she draped herself in a terry robe, a garment I knew wouldn't stay on for long. We'll need some food and beer, she declared, retrieving two bottles of light ale from the refrigerator and a pizza from the freezer. As she set the timer for the oven, we cracked open the beers. So, were you serious about not taking her back, she inquired. At the moment, perhaps I spoke too hastily. But with you, things feel different. Having this experience with you makes moving on seem more plausible. Besides, who's to say she'll even want to come back? She must have given it a lot of thought before leaving. She may soon realize her mistake, but whether she'll have the courage to ask for a second chance remains to be seen. And honestly, knowing she's been with someone else for so long, I'm not sure I can get past that. Our relationship may be irreparable. I can't imagine her convincing me otherwise. Well, honey, no matter what happens, you always have me to drive you wild. That's a promise, she assured me. We polished off our beers as the microwave signaled the pizza was ready. Devouring it in record time, we indulged in more beer before indulging in each other once again, experiencing an unforgettable night of passion.
In the morning, I awoke beside her, both of us naked. As she stirred, she headed to the bathroom to brush her teeth, offering me a spare toothbrush. Afterward, we shared a shower, the intensity of which left me breathless. We cooked and enjoyed a hearty breakfast in the nude, seeing no reason to dress. Lounging on her sofa, sated from our meal, we found ourselves drawn to each other once more, succumbing to desire with fervor. I never expected this, Clara admitted, her gaze lingering on my eager state. You're like a machine, she teased, proposing a conversation after another round. Yes. Twenty minutes later, she went to the bathroom. Maybe we should get dressed, otherwise, we might die or have a stroke or something else. Fine, but only for a few minutes. I put on my gym shorts and t-shirt, she put on a dress. However, I was well aware of what was underneath the dress. And what can I do about it? Jesus Christ, what's going on here, Clara? Clara was serious, apparently, she had difficulty integrating the last day into her previous experiences. We may be the most sexually compatible two people in the whole world. This was my real opinion. I thought about it while I brushed my teeth. It didn't take me long to come to this conclusion. I read about sex, discussed with my friends, even read some of Dan Savage's sex advice columns and a few others. But I have never heard of anything like what happened between me and Clara. It seemed like we were in uncharted waters. How long will it be going on? And if so, will we be able to survive? Clara smiled when I said this, but her words made sense. We don't know the answers to these questions, Joe. There's only one way to find out. I think we should move to my place so I can change and check my email. If you sit further away from me in the car, we can get there just a short trip. She laughed, and I joined her. We were rolling on the floor laughing when everything calmed down. We decided to give it a try, so to speak. Our fury subsided slightly. We got dressed and went to my house. As far as I knew, she had never been inside and began to look around. While she was doing this, I managed to do a little work. I went upstairs and changed into new shorts and a new shirt. It was Sunday. I turned on baseball. I found out she was a big fan of his. Me too. We watched for almost an hour before I started fondling her. This time, we went upstairs to the master bedroom. I made love to her tenderly. This took quite a long time and led to another mutual climax. It was amazing. I could count on one hand the number of times this happened to Shelly and me. Clara looked at me and cried, saying, Joey, I fell in love with you. I just want to thank you for everything. Now she was crying, and I started crying too. In the end, we dried ourselves off. I said, I wonder what's in the game. We went back downstairs and watched the last two innings. She actually knew a lot about the game and knew when the home team guys would try to steal the ball or make a hit and run. She was completely involved in the game until the very end. Me too. I made us some food, chicken roast. We ate and drank wine. We had a lot of light stroking, love caresses, looking at her eye to eye. I realized that I would always want her to be next to me. She said, I'm in love with you, Joe, and I'll fight to keep it. You don't need to fight. I'm all yours. We went back upstairs. We started with another love match of tender sex, then again, several times, including in the morning while we were having breakfast. It's time for me to go to court and then to therapy. Maybe I don't need therapy as much now, but I'll still go. If you're here when I get back, I'll cook the food again. I'll be here. I would say in full dress, but most likely I will be naked. After we laughed, I kissed her and took her home. I was standing in court with a lawyer from my firm when Connor and Shelley came in with their lawyer. Vanguard's lawyer was also present. Judge Carlson came to the bench. Shell didn't look at me. Connor looked back, caught his eye, then turned away. Vanguard's lawyer outlined his concerns and the reason why the transfer was blocked. The order to transfer money came from a computer that was not recognized. He arrived at 3 a.m. The email check also led to this computer. The computer was not one that had ever been used for this account before. In addition, the account into which the money was to be transferred did not belong to either Mrs. or Mr. Mason. 
the algorithm used by the firm blocked the transfer. The money has been blocked until both account holders are notified. The lawyer said his firm did not want to be held liable if there was a dispute over the money, so he was happy to get the TRRO. My lawyer said that the money was joint property and was taken without my knowledge or consent, and now even with my objection. He explained that Shelley left me without warning, quit her job, moved to Pittsburgh, and moved in with William Connor. Their lawyer said that she had the same right to withdraw money from the account as I did and that the money should go to where she was trying to transfer it. The judge asked the guy from Vanguard, where should the money be sent, to a local bank account belonging solely to William Connor. Have you already found out whose computer was used during the transfer attempt? No, this is beyond our power now, the judge said. I would like Mrs. Mason to take the oath, please, he added. When he said this, Shelley seemed to withdraw into herself. Connor grabbed her hand. The secretary asked her to raise her right hand. She managed to do it, but finally did it hesitantly. When asked if she swears to tell the truth, she answered yes. Mrs. Mason, are you married to Joseph Mason? Yes. Did you jointly own an account with him at Vanguard? Yes. Last week you tried to withdraw $200,000 from this account? I know. She looked around wildly. Connor threw her hand away and stepped aside. Did you in any way give someone permission to withdraw money? Not really. Explain, please. Bill Mr. Connor asked to borrow $20,000 to pay off several overdue debts. I reluctantly agreed. He asked me for the password after my computer was not working. I gave him my password. He used his computer, and I used it for email. He sat on it for a few minutes and then closed it. I didn't know anything about $200,000. When did you find out that this was exactly the amount they were talking about? When I received a written notification, the judge looked at Connor and made a note in his notebook. Mr. Connor, could you tell me your name and address? I'm not here to be a party to this. I came to help Michelle. Just follow the order, sir, he did it. I already had the information, the judge asked my lawyer, is Mr. Mason going to file for divorce? Yes, the lawsuit has already been written and will be filed this week. A judge ordered Vanguard to freeze the account until a family law court could review the assets. He told my lawyer that he had to submit the application by the end of the day tomorrow, otherwise, he would reconsider the freezing decision. I noticed that Shelley had sunk into a chair at the table. Connor ran out. She sat there silently with her head in her hands. The small courtroom was empty. It was just Shelley and me left. The bailiff wanted us to leave so he could lock the door. I took her out into the corridor. Connor was nowhere to be seen. Only a few people walked past in the corridor. I looked at Shelly. You came here with this idiot? She stared at me. Yes. I think you need to take the bus back to your new life, Joey. I'm sorry this happened. I just thought he was mine, mine betrothed. This is what you told your family. Looks like I was wrong, such a fool. I can't tell you how deeply you hurt and upset me by writing that short note and ending a long marriage, Joey. Our marriage is not over. I see that. I was stupid. I'd like to go back to be your wife. Tears were flowing down her cheeks. Sorry, Shelly. It's beyond my power. You've been having sex with that, four months behind my back. She ran away without even talking to me. She lived with him as with her husband. Well, you have to accept the bad along with the good. Can't we go somewhere more private? What about the children? They are unhappy with you, and you know it. Do you have any real explanation for why you just threw me away like a used napkin? No. If you had asked me before, I would have said that he is my soulmate. That's what I said. I thought it would be easier for you if there was a complete break. But I have no explanation right now why I was so stupid, she started crying in earnest. I didn't like seeing her in this state, but I refrain from any contact. I'm done with her, at least as a wife. There is a limit to everything, yes, and Clara, she is my soulmate. Well, at least she is the absolute pinnacle of a sexual partner, and I like her even apart from that. It seems so to me, I asked Shelly what she was going to do. I have a job in Pittsburgh. I have a shift tomorrow there. I have to pay rent. 
I signed a lease for a year. I'll kick Bill out and see what happens. Maybe after a while, you will start to miss me. Then let me know, will you? Certainly. I'll probably miss you, but I'd like to know what went wrong. I'm still shocked and confused. I thought that everything was fine with us. I didn't even suspect it. When I can formulate it, I'll let you know, she hugged me and left. I didn't know what to think. Felt a deep, deep sadness, so much so that I cried openly when she crossed the threshold. But underneath the sadness, I had a knot of anger twisting my insides. I decided that a session with a therapist was essential and went to an appointment that afternoon after lunch at Subway, a hot tuna sandwich with a layer of melted cheese. Mary Stevens, a marriage counselor, emphasized that she is not a therapist. She mainly deals with troubled marriages and their consequences if necessary. At first glance, she was a gray-haired grandmother, but as she crossed the office to shake my hand, she moved with athletic grace, and her smile was sunny and sincere. I liked her right away. What brings you here, Mr. Mason? Please call me Joe. My wife suddenly left me. She left a short note and moved to Pittsburgh to be with her new man. Before that, she had sex with him for about a month. It's clear. And how did you react? I explained that I had been completely busy at first, then talked about the session with Jed and the subsequent sessions with the heavy bag. I said I was heartbroken, and then I got angry. Now I think I had both at the same time. I think that you quickly went through several stages which change when marriages end, depression, sadness, anger. Usually, they can alternate for quite a long time. How are you feeling now? Well, I'm confused. I was at the gym, lifting weights. It was vending anger, I guess. There was a pretty nurse there, Clara Barton, who I knew through Shelly, if you can believe it. I cornered her and asked her what Shelly was doing at work with the idiot doctor. She didn't want to tell, but still, she told something. Then I noticed her in spandex on the treadmill. There was a mirror there. She saw me staring at her. She looked at me like that, and I stared back. The next thing I remember is that we are in her apartment across the street, having sex. And I've never done this before. We just didn't leave each other's side all night and the next day. This has been going on for several days now. I had a hard time making it to today's court hearing. Mary Stevens looked shocked at first, but then she started smiling. I already said how much I love her smile. So you are at least sexually attracted to Clara Barton, the nurse now? She was almost laughing. There was a sparkle in her eyes. She asked, how did she get this name, Barton, a man's name, and became a nurse? I'm ashamed to say, but I didn't ask her about it. When we have time to talk, I'll ask. So far, we haven't talked much. I'm tempted to ask for details, but no, it would be inappropriate. She tilted her head in a certain way. We sat on two chairs on opposite sides of the table. She crossed her legs and smiled. I started to react. This woman harassed me, and she looked completely different from the grandmother I saw for the first time. I suspected something was wrong and said, It seems to me that you are showing me something, some way to show me what I experienced. I don't know how else to express this. Well, she changed her expression, looking at least surprised and so to speak impressed, and then said, Amazing insight on your part, especially for a man. You got the point right away. I must be losing my qualifications. Oh no, you have achieved the desired effect, believe me. I crossed my legs and turned away from her. Well, the point I was trying to get across, and I think I got across, is that you can be especially sexually vulnerable at this time. You can become prey to women who see an opportunity in you. I'm not saying that Clara's feelings for you are not sincere. I'm also not saying that your reciprocity is not sincere, although somewhat one-dimensional. But I think you should get to know her better once you two can find time to talk. I'm sure we'll find the time, Mary. She even laughed out loud. You're a quick thinker, Joe. I understand you. Clara said she always found me attractive but forbidden fruit. Well, Joe, I don't want to spoil our relationship. Yes, and I can't. However, I want to say that what you described goes beyond what might be typical for outside sex. 
it is quite possible that everything is real and for a long time. There have been documented cases of extreme sexual compatibility, very unusual. Maybe because there are more of them, but they are not reported as often. I only bring this up because I want to try to separate your new relationship with Clara from your marriage for the time being. Why isn't a new relationship part of my choice? Yes, they are. However, I would like to deal with the marriage as it was, and this may affect your future behavior. Okay, I understand. Well, we had, as it seemed to me, a good, strong marriage. I loved her. I thought that she loved me too. We raised our children and did not argue often. At times, and I'm a trial lawyer, at times, I worked very, very hard, but I always found time for our relationship, at least for sex. And before she left, a long trial has just ended, about a month of no sex, neither for me nor for her. She received it elsewhere, and I didn't even notice. My fault. So Shelly's youngest child, her only daughter, is off to college. You were very busy, and she probably felt old. Maybe this happened, maybe, maybe, but she needed to talk to me about it. She didn't. She just decided to marry someone else, for some complete thief idiot. What would you do if she told you that she feels lost, or that she is being tempted, or worse, that she had given in to temptation? In the first two cases, I would try to help. Maybe I will come to you. And if she already had sex with him, then it's too late, I think. So having cheated, you won't be able to stay, mostly. It is very important for me. I kept my promise well, until she left me. But that's a pretty hard line, right? What if it was just a drinking session for one evening? Same thing, or maybe not, depending on what she did when she got drunk. In any case, what are all these hypotheses for? In real life, she did what she did, and this is completely unacceptable. Fine, I'd like to continue this next week. Certainly, you are a very interesting woman, completely unexpected. I'll be glad to see you again, that is if you're not too tired, she smiled. We set a time. Since it was already four, I decided to go home. When I arrived, Clara was sitting on the porch reading. We didn't talk for long, we just said hello. Then we lay in bed for 90 minutes. Afterwards, we prepared food, fried potatoes, spring onions, minced lamb, spices, hot spices. The taste was great. I told Clara about the hearing while we were cooking and eating. We were not completely naked, almost but not quite. I'd like to talk, if you don't mind. I tried not to pay attention to Clara's bare breasts, to cook and eat dinner. She wore shorts but no top. Fine, just a second. Clara took the t-shirt and put it on. Thank you. Maybe we can find some time. We are full and dressed. Maybe, she said. I think this is a serious topic. About what? I went to see a psychotherapist today after the hearing. I told her about what we had, with you, and how it kept growing. She called it sexual hypercompatibility. I think this means that we are sexually obsessed with each other. She said this could be a recovery for me, but she doesn't really think so. She said that sex during recovery is not like what I described. I admit I was curious about how we can just keep going like this. I'm sure, absolutely sure, but if you took off your shorts, I'd be on my knees in no time. This is strange. I need to make a decision about Shelly, the divorce, all of this. She returned to Pittsburgh, but not to the... She said that she had rent and work. This was after I told her it was over between us. Sounds like she might be looking in Pittsburgh for something. Don't know. I can only say that if what we have is real, I will not give it up. But it hasn't been that long since I was in a so-called happy marriage. I'm disoriented. Before I make any permanent decisions, I want to get to know you in a non-biblical way. Sounds like a plan. What would you like to know? Clara talked about her suburban upbringing, college, and relationships there. They broke up after college. She graduated as a nurse, got a job here, met and married a doctor. He was a gynecologist. I was happy with our life, but he changed me. I got involved with a woman from our area and wasn't careful enough. I discovered his infidelity and confronted him about it. 
he apologized, and against my better judgment, I chose to forgive him and salvage our marriage. Unfortunately, history repeated itself about a year later. The divorce proceedings resulted in a satisfactory settlement for me, and he relocated his practice to New York. Since then, I've focused on rebuilding my life. It's been five years, during which I've had a series of short-term relationships, including a friend with benefits until he moved away. Are you considering moving abroad? Clara asked during our gym encounter, which had occurred almost a month prior and left much to be desired. No, but I do have a vibrator, I admitted. Well, now you have me, I leaned in to kiss her, igniting a passionate spark between us. Later, in bed, our conversation flowed, with Clara prompting me to share my life story. Although she was already familiar with recent events, I delved into earlier chapters, and before long, we drifted off to sleep, sated from our physical and emotional connection. Over the following days, our sexual escapades continued, albeit at a slightly slower pace. I confided in Mary Stevens, who encouraged me to explore new relationships. Clara, it seemed, had a keen interest in baseball, sparking discussions about our respective pasts. As our bond deepened, Clara expressed a desire to try for a relationship, prompting us to delve into the intricacies of my failed marriage. Mary helped me navigate my emotions surrounding the betrayal. And our sessions also touched upon my feelings towards Dr. Connor, which I realized had dwindled to a state of indifference. I feel done and quartered, I confess to Mary, acknowledging the depth of my emotional wounds. Clara's presence brought warmth and stability to my life, and despite my initial reservations about commitment, I found myself falling deeply in love with her. When she announced her pregnancy, our intimacy only grew stronger, culminating in the birth of our daughter Linda a few days after our simple courthouse wedding. As we celebrated our growing family, I couldn't help but reflect on the twists and turns that led me to this moment. Despite the pain of the past, I felt immense gratitude for the happiness Clara had brought into my life, and I knew that our love would endure for years to come. What do you think of today's story? I think it had enough of everything, interesting moments, plot twists, and enough characters involved. Write your opinion in the comments. See you in the next videos.